"'Tis five miles from Croydon, one mile from Wimbledon. Mr. Morris had said in directing us where to find him. The drive was not remarkably picturesque, but to American eyes no bit of rural England can be devoid of interest and charm. The most ordinary objects seem under a spell to bewitch us back into the dream world of a previous existence. We began to inquire our way. Before long we approached a plain low double house set back and somewhat raised from the level of the road. When you walked into the yard, you were only a hundred feet from the high, Merton High Street. It was just like being in a rural world of your own. The River Wandle ran through the middle of the complex and was essential to the whole operation. The buildings themselves were built by the Huguenots. They were emigres driven out from France. They had come over, over into the south of London and established themselves. This was part of their works. Nowhere was one conscious of the depressing sense of confinement that usually pervades a factory. There was plenty of air and light. Even the busiest room was filled with the ceaseless din of whirring looms where the artisans sat bending over the threads. Morris took advantage of this complex and had to adapt the buildings to, to his own requirements. The building on the right hand side, the ground floor was a dying complex and upstairs was stained glass. Behind this was the repair hub for tapestries, which was adjoined by the weaving shed. Situated on the opposite bank of the river, the fabric printing shed. In the first outhouse that we entered stood great vats of liquid dye into which some skins of unbleached wool were dipped for our amusement. As they were brought dripping forth they appeared of sea green colour but after a few minutes exposure to the air they settled into a fast dusky blue. Above the dyeing vats was a stained glass studio. The whole of this building was about 200 feet long. To get upstairs you used to go to a large staircase to the window about 12 to 14 feet high by about 8 feet wide at the top. This was a display window so that when the stained glass was finished with we used to put it up, fix it up, bat battening onto this window and then go down to the bottom of the stairs and you had the impression of being in a church looking up at a stained glass window. The various processes of dyeing, stamping and weaving fabrics of wool, cloth and silk and of staining designs upon glass are carried out by male and female operatives of all ages. From 14 or 15 upwards and of different degrees of skill ranging from the uneducated mechanic or dye mixer to the intelligent artist. In the weaving shed the looms ran up each side of the shed. I should think there were about eight or nine each side, and at one time they used to have up to twenty weavers working in there. It was an art on its own, like learning to ride a bike. Behind the stained glass building was a repair hub for tapestries. This wasn't used a great deal, and it was quite a modern building. There was a small group of buildings up against the road. When Morris was in his heyday, he used to use one of the buildings as a dormitory for the people he found jobs for. The working day consisted 8.30 start until 5.30, an hour off for dinner and two breaks, with just Saturday mornings 8 till 1. In those days this was considered to be generous, for the simple reason the work was of a mental character and very trying at times. There is no branch of work performed in Mr Morris's factory in which he himself is not skilled. He has rediscovered lost methods and carefully studied existing processes. His aim has been to revive a sense of beauty in home life, to restore the dignity of art to ordinary household decoration. So strong and wide has been his influence 